So hopefully, actually riffing off what Dan's just talked about, I'll be able to touch on a few of the things that you were asking here, maybe in this presentation. And mine's a little bit different because um, I'm all focused in on the future trends right now, the future of work, future of learning as you are, because you're here. Um, and I hope that obviously be able to provide some tools and frameworks today and some um, slightly more curious examples based from kids, actually. I always think we can learn a lot off kids, so hopefully you'll see what I mean when we go through. So we called this event Back to the Future because I think there's so much you can learn by actually going backwards sometimes to look at where we came from to where we are now, and just as much as that to look at where we are now as to where we want to go. So hopefully everybody's seen Back to the Future in here, haven't they? Does anybody actually tell me the year that the first movie was produced? 84. So close. 85. Dan actually got it earlier. I, I quizzed him and he, he nailed it. 85. So it's 30, it's 34 years old, which makes actually wow. me feel really old because I remember just being there at the start of this, loving the DeLorean and learning a lot from Marty McFly, who, in case somebody hasn't seen it, accidentally transports himself back 30 years and somehow ends up being the love interest of his mother. So clearly at this point, they have to um, do some coolness with Doc Martin, the crazy scientist, to get him back into the future and not screw it up, essentially. I just love looking at this handheld VC camera here and this massive thing. So I thought there's a lot to learn from, obviously movies where they often look way into the future of what could be. And if you think about the DeLorean and some of this, some of this actually still stands and is here now. Um, but I do think there's a lot to be said for as we said, going back to the future. So I'm sure that you have used future-focused scenarios of tools and frameworks when you are producing your learning and talking with your teams. But I just wanted to touch on why, um, just two that I think are really interesting. If you've used them, I'd love to know. So future visions are really, really great for planning strategically, looking at sustainability and even mitigating for disasters. People do this a lot when they're looking at the environment, global warming, etc. Um, they're also fantastic for getting a diverse range of stakeholders to actually articulate their ideas and present on what they think might be possible. And they are also excellent for being part of a design process to give somebody a future-based scenario and then see what they think of it. So you could say, hey, it's 2030 and New Zealand Customs are faced with this happening, what would you do in this example? And one of these is called future casting. Has anybody done much future casting before. So I just sort of thought of give you an example. Uh, I have just been through this uh, through the University of Sydney in designing for the future of work and they actually got me to describe my current work as a learning partner at Inspire Group and to look at what tools and tech we use as a business and across the team and then also to look at what I currently do in the workplace, what we all currently do, what our functions are, what our skills are. So you do sort of an audit of where you're at and then you get to forecast the future of your work. So what parts of what we do will be most susceptible to automation. And I was actually quite pleased as I went through all their frameworks to see that a lot of what I do as a learning partner is the people-based interaction. So less of that can be automated, thankfully, but a lot of our other work can be that allows us to do more of the creative solution solving, problem solving challenges for you. Um, and then you also got to look at which parts of the business and also your role rely more on the human capability. And as I said, for Inspire Group, it's massive for us. We're all about the people and understanding the psychology behind what makes great learning. And then you get to design your preferable work future. And I haven't actually told this to Dan yet, but you get to, this was really fascinating for me. You really have to, I don't know if anybody's ever thought five years ahead or 10 years ahead, but it can be a really fun exercise, but it can also be quite demanding. So um, for me, I was actually thinking that all our clients wouldn't necessarily be as based in central Wellington. In fact, you're going to have hubs all over the world. You'd be using um, outsourcing different teams from around the world, different languages. Uh, we'd be doing a lot more virtual calls. So we'd be using a lot more mobile calls, etc., to work with you. We'd be updating things real time. It'd be very much cloud based and uh, there'd be less of that visiting in person, but still connecting very much through these tools. And then you also get to look at what a probable future looks like. So what is most likely to happen? So I went a little bit far out there and then I had to dial it back to what's actually probably likely in the next five years. So that's an idea around future casting. And once you have that sort of future scenario, then you can use something called back casting. Again, has anybody used this before? Just want to make, see if I'm teaching something new or if people know it, because I thought this was really fascinating. So this isn't about going way backwards but it is actually looking at what events and conditions and triggers are needed to reach this future state that you've just designed. 
And then you ask the question, well, what would need to exist for this to actually happen? So it's quite a neat way of being able to say, that's great. We can future focus all we want and think up and imagine an amazing future. But what do we need to do to work backwards to where we are now to make it happen? Pretty logical. So again, it has sort of three aspects to it. This thing called domain and demographics, where you're looking at what are the current issues of state? Who are the stakeholders that we actually need to engage? And I know you come across this all the time when you're designing for learning. And which are the really key areas that we need to target? And then you go into, again, defining and describing a future where that has already been solved. So you put yourself in that present state. And from there, start to create some scenarios that are gonna meet your learning objectives. And then finally, you now sit down with this team who've collaborated in a workshop on doing this, or maybe online in a workshop, and you look at some of the steps that are actually gonna help you to reach that probable or possible future, and some of the ways that you're gonna be able to assess what makes for great learning. And I thought that was quite on point with Back to the Future, because you've got a little bit of back casting, a little bit of future casting, um, and you get to these points. I've got some really great um, frameworks or structures for you to run this for yourself if you'd like, like actually how to hold a workshop to do this, so I can send that after this. And then I just wanted to give an example in action. I was really fortunate to facilitate a workshop at the recent Digital Skills Forum HUI that was actually in February in Wellington. Did anybody here go to that? It was a fascinating day, so they got about 300 people together and held three workshop streams, and I was in the future of work stream, which was super fun. And we got to basically allow people to imagine and crowdsource, so I know somebody was talking about that before, we got them to crowdsource what they thought is needed to allow people to have the skills to work in the future when a lot of these roles are becoming automated and won't exist anymore. Uh, I think it's about 14 to 30% of jobs won't exist by 2030, but they'll be replaced with so many new ones. And we basically got them to wave a magic wand and say, if you could do that, what was one thing that you would do to improve the readiness of our people, organizations, communities, or country for the future of work. Um, so you can imagine you've got like about 100 people in a room, all in tables of 10, very lively discussions. And uh, we did give them some frameworks to go through to make this happen. So I thought I'd share that with you because I thought it actually would be easy to apply to the way you're going about collaborating with your stakeholders and the people in your teams and the staff in your organizations to get their buy-in to what you're producing. So the workshop session was, we set a little bit of scene, and then we got people thinking, an exercise of just five minutes. So we did this, um, turn to your neighbor, wave that wand, just discuss. And it was really fascinating because there were a lot of people from education, but then also the corporate sector, the government sector, and everybody had very different ideas, and some were far more advanced, I guess, in their thoughts around this. They'd been more exposed to it, and some people really hadn't, I guess, gotten to the point of thinking about it, um, which always makes for interesting answers, right? <laughs> So Bob turns to Sally, I'd like everyone in New Zealand to know how to reinvent themselves when their livelihood is threatened. And Sally says to Bob, I want our education system to value the arts and not kill creativity. And then boom, conversation starts. And then from there, we got them into this abundance mindset because often you know, you go to these future state sort of workshops and people are like, oh, well, it's great, but nothing's gonna happen. So what we got them to really do is say, write down all the things you'd love to do, followed by, but that won't happen because and just go for it. So there was a really nice example there around micro training. And then we got them to take those things that they'd love to do, take out everything after the but, and replace it with some actual statements for how that could happen. So immediately in the room, the sense shifted to, okay, what's possible? Or if it's not possible right now, how can we make this happen? What do we have right now that could actually make this more likely? And then from there, we collected those, we refined and prioritised because um, as you have with groups, some people are more vocal. So we wanted to make sure that everybody had their say. And we got them into smaller groups of around five people and each person sort of presented their idea as to why it was not necessarily the best, but the most likely to happen or the most useful for the scenario. And then we did that as a group and we got the top 10 reflections and, oh, sorry, and from there, they actually consolidated that into a big report. I would preferably prefer that they actually then took that and made it into how do we continue this conversation and actually have the learning happening. But this was a great start and it happened right here in Wellington. And it, it was so neat to see it happening in the room, how people were super engaged and suddenly saw the possibility. So taking that example, hopefully that was sort of helpful just to see, which could sort of be there in the room with you. I just wanted to share now some 
facts from the Future of Learning conference that I fortunately got to attend thanks to Inspire Group recently in Christchurch. It was very, very much educator focused, so there were a lot of people from government, from schools, etc. And these were some of the scary stats that came out of it. it was scary in a good way. So basically, employers want digital skills. Massive, that's obvious, everything is going more of the digital way, the mobile space. You need to be savvy in that space, you need to understand tools and technology. But also bilingual skills, just because we have a multicultural melting pot in this world, there's so many more languages being spoken, more immigrants coming in, just a whole lot more languages to deal with and different cultural ways in which we interact. Critical thinking, you've seen this come up a lot. So as the robots come in, um, they actually really can't replace us when it comes to critical thinking, solving problems, really thinking uh, from an imagination point of view and future forecasting. And then creativity and innovation. Luckily, these are all some of our innate human talents. So this was really fascinating to sort of see the demand and how it's risen. And then from there, I thought this was really useful to you to see by actually just next year, isn't that crazy? We're gonna be spending 30% more of our time learning on the job, which may not be crazy to you. I think that's a great thing. I think it should be more. 100% more time on problem solving. So hopefully that's got your mind thinking about what you need to do to be able to help people do that better, because it is a skill. And then 25% more time engaging in self-directed work and also self-directed learning. Any surprises there? I think the bilingual one, Mm. Was a nice yeah. yeah, and luckily there are things like AI that are doing real-time translation for different languages. I actually bought, just reminds me, I bought an earpiece way a long time ago on Kickstarter that meant I could put it in my ear and if I went over to China, I could ask somebody a question in English, they could respond in Mandarin and I'd instantly hear it in English in my earpod. It was fascinating. Didn't actually yeah, get to use it effectively. But what's that? Yeah. Exactly, and I paid something like $200 for this little earpiece at the time, but hey. That's the first mover advantage. First mover advantage, yeah. So um, why I wanted to come to kids is that I think we can learn so much off them, and right now they are having to learn so many different skills. This stat is crazy. So if you used to ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up, which I don't think is a great question to ask, but these days I don't know how they're going to answer because it's likely that the job or the role they're going to go into doesn't even exist yet. So how do you answer for something that's not existing? Um, and 17 different jobs over five different careers in their lifetime. So they're going to be highly skilled and uh, they're going to be moving around a lot. So I wanted to give some examples of some New Zealand and Australian based startups that are doing some really cool work in helping just what we talked about at the end of Dan's presentation, giving people real life skills kind of on the job or in the scenario, as well as being able to learn digitally and through mobile. So has anybody heard of Banker here? Is anybody's kids in yeah? So this is a really neat New Zealand startup. There are 85,000 students are using it who are kind of 10 years old and up. They're in half of the schools in New Zealand. And they basically teach kids without giving them any money how to trade, how to invest, how to deal with mortgages. So they're giving them like real life skills on how to handle their finances more responsibly. And they use it in schools and they do it as group facilitation and they even get people to do volunteer work, use their um, profits to donate. It's really amazing and um, even pay each other, but it's all fictitious. Um, but it's been fascinating for kids to also understand and appreciate how their parents are dealing with budgets and finances. So this is one use of a platform, but also in the classroom and then collaboratively as teams. Really cool example. The next one is $20 Boss. Has anybody heard of this? This is actually in Australia, so they've rolled it out for free. It's not dissimilar to YES, the Young Enterprise Scheme here in New Zealand, but essentially they give them $20 of real money. You go and find a team and you essentially create a business. And this is school kids. And um, as an entrepreneur as well, uh, some of the best skills you learn are from just figuring stuff out, being very enterprising, coming up with um, solutions to problems that seem really difficult understanding how you can pitch clients, coming up with great offers, and they're doing this at a school age. I would have loved this. So again, this is sort of 10 year olds and up. And um, surprisingly, a lot of the ones who are making profit are then looking at how they can distribute that through donations and to really great causes. So there's some beautiful sort of fantastic ethics and morals coming through there. And, but they're building these skills in school right now, which is all the enterprising skills that employers are now looking for. And then the final one, um, and I got to see this in person in Christchurch, has anybody heard of Amy? Is anybody's kids using Amy? It is an AI math tutoring um, 
sorry, yeah, an AO maths tutor that can scale well beyond just the average tutor who's down the road. So there might be only the ability for you to teach four or five students, but this is an AI tool. And it is incredible because it actually learns from you as AI does, but you learn from it at the same time. So it can track if you're understanding the equations in maths. And he actually did an example of it. And if you keep putting in the wrong answer and it keeps going, hey, that's great, you know, it's really encouraging, try again rather than no, you're wrong. Can you bring it into an exam? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but what it does is it starts to go, okay, this, this kid's not getting this thing, so I'm gonna step back one phase and I'm going to simplify it a bit more and I'm going to get them to go through a simpler equation and if they still don't get it I'll step back again and then once they've got it and you can see the pattern they start progressing you forward and honestly I was watching it real time and I didn't mind maths at school but it wasn't my favorite subject um, and I was like oh, I just want to learn you could see all the adults in the room suddenly going I wish I had this at school so the ability to use in this case for me AI to learn from you and to learn from is a really good example of thinking through how you could use this in your learning based solutions. Um, I think there was an option to do that for, yep, for accessibility. Um, and I did just want to riff on what um, Dan said, podcasts are fantastic. I actually run a podcast, but I also love that you can transcribe them real time, right? So for people who can't hear, there's always options for any media file that you have. So I just wanted to show those three as examples of cool stuff that's happening for kids, but is actually giving them real life fantastic skills to be able to strive in the future of work and be highly employable. And I wonder sometimes whether in our own learning environments we get a little shut down on thinking more in this way, this refreshing way of doing. And I know sometimes with remote work it's harder, but I do think there are a lot of ways to be able to use some of these tools, especially mobile apps, to facilitate better peer-to-peer -peer learning, real-time examples, and assess how people are progressing through actual skills that they're turning up with and using real-time. So they were just, oh, well, that was, what was where I was finishing, so thank you. Um, yeah, that was just what I wanted to share with you today. Hope some of those were useful. And we'll send these across as well for you to look at. And um, hope that was helpful. Yeah.